the American flag blouts out the swastika. Hello and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Francis Steve Sellers, a senior writer here at the Washington Post. Today we're going to take another step toward explaining America, and I'm going to be talking with Dr. Robert Kagan. He's a best-selling author, he's a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and an editor at large at the Washington Post. Bob Kagan, a very warm welcome to Washington Post Live. Thank you, it's great to be here. We are, of course, delighted to have you. And we're going to be talking about this book, uh, which focuses your new book, the ghost, the, the ghost at the Feast, on the early part of the 20th century. But I want to first talk to you about the immediate post-Second World War period and a period you told, called um, The World America Made in another book. Tell us about that foundational moment. Well, World War II obviously was, uh, it came about because Americans felt that uh, the liberal world order that was already in, in shaky condition uh, by the 1930s was about to be exploded by the expansion of the power of Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. The United States wound up going to war to defeat them and, and really, I think, to reassert and reestablish a, a liberal democratic hegemony in the world. And that's basically what the United States did after World War II. Um, instead of retreating back uh, within its own borders and letting the world take whatever course it was gonna take, the United States established um, you know, the NATO alliance, relationships in Asia, and created a situation which for all its flaws, and there were many mistakes, and we all know about Vietnam and Iraq, but overall, uh, created a situation of global peace among great powers, which uh, lasted eight decades and is really one of the longest periods of great power peace in history. And I think that's uh, quite an accomplishment, and that is what is being tested again today. Just going back to that moment, how much was it um, an issue that was specifically American? Um, or was it this moment after the Second World War, one driven by the, the circumstances of the moment? Well, it, it was driven by the circumstances of the moment, obviously, but Americans have a certain view of how the world should be shaped. They've demonstrated that time and again, uh, ever since the United States became a great power at the beginning of the 20th century, both in the First World War and in the Second World War and during the Cold War. Uh, and the world has been shaped in a way, as, as is always the case with world orders, it's shaped by the leading powers uh, in the system. That would be the United States and its democratic allies. And that is, you know, we have a democratic liberal world today because the strongest powers in the world are liberal democracies. In, a di in different periods of time, we've had autocracies being the dominant powers. And so the world was fundamentally one of authoritarian government. So, you know, the way the world looks today reflects clearly the preferences uh, of the American public, which are widely shared around the, the globe when it comes to, you know, how do people want to govern themselves? So the United States found a lot of allies in this task, but it definitely was the power of the United States after World War II that made this world possible. So tell me a little bit more again about what is specifically American? What are these American values that allowed this sort of universalist approach to happen after the Second World War? Right. Well, I mean, the United States is the first uh, government founded on 
universal principles as enunciated in the Declaration of Independence. Before that, there really was no uh, kind of liberal democracy in the world. And and when the United States emerged as a liberal democracy, it faced uh, you know significant outside pressures uh, from absolutist governments that felt threatened by the United States. My first volume uh, in this series of, of histories of American foreign policy is called Dangerous Nation, because that is how the authoritarian governments of Europe viewed the young United States uh, rising as a, in their view, liberal, democratic, but but more importantly, revolutionary uh, society. So the United States does bring uh, uh, special qualities to this that, that I think other countries obviously wouldn't, although today the idea of universal rights has spread uh, enormously around the globe. Uh, it's worth remembering that that was quite the opposite case when the United States uh, first came on the scene in the late 18th century. So you're sort of proposing this sort of benevolent global hegemony, US-led. Is there a precedent for it? How very different is it from the, well, let's say the British Empire? It is different from the British Empire in the sense that, first of all, it's not an empire, despite what everybody uh, likes to say. The United States, it, it, it's a, rather remarkable how much the, deg the degree to which other countries in the world have uh, welcomed America's involvement in power in international affairs. If you look at, you know, the way Europe has responded whenever the United States has pulled back, they've, they've basically... Uh, beg the United States to come back in. And I think that's an important attribute that it's it's worth remembering that the United States is not uh, asserting, uh, you know, its dominance over other countries. Um, it What it's doing is creating an environment in which people who want liberal democracy have an opportunity to practice it. Now, if you are not a liberal democracy, if you're an autocracy like China and Russia, then you do feel that the United States is imposing its will uh, on the world, and there's and there's truth to that from their perspective. That's the way the world looks. But forgive me if I oversimplify, but I'm I'm thinking about that. The emails I'll get later, and there'll be people who'll say, you know, U.S. Yeah. for a long time has been hypocritical about these issues. It's it's advocated for rules um, governing the world, but hasn't always signed onto treaties. And more recently, it seemed unreliable. And we can think of the Paris Accord signing, then go going back. So what is the rest of the world to make of this notion? How am I going to answer my emails? Just quickly. <laughs> well, I mean, the United States is like all uh, organizations of human beings. It is hypocritical. It's selfish. Americans are not less selfish than other peoples in the world. It's just that the question that other peoples in the world have to ask themselves is what kind of world do they want to live in? It's not, it, the choice is not between having American uh, power and no power. Uh, other countries will fill in the vacuum. If countries want to see Russia and China be more dominant in the world, they have that, they have that option. But I think what we're seeing around the world rather remarkably is the degree to which other countries do not want to uh, be under the thumb of China and Russia, and look to the United States, despite all its flaws and all its mistakes and all the things that we can point to that have gone wrong in American foreign policy, I think the remarkable thing uh, is nevertheless how many countries in the world continue, and even more today than in the past, look to the United States uh, for support and protection and to sustain uh, this liberal order that they and the Americans uh, all benefit from. Oh, just expand on that a little bit, if you could, about how Americans benefit from this liberal world order you're talking about it, and do they understand that they're benefiting from it? Well, that's kind of the question that I've I've been that I raised in this book, and and you the introduction quoted my writing about the ambivalence that Americans have. I think Americans are fu fundamentally often not conscious. Uh, that there is a certain kind of uh, world system from which they do benefit. How do they benefit? America has always benefited from a, a free trade uh, international environment. I know people think uh, that that has cost us jobs, but on net, it has made the United States the wealthy country that it is. I think that most people understand uh, that, you know, we would rather live in a world that was dominated by democracy and liberalism rather than a world dominated by autocracies. And if you look at the American public's reaction to what's happening in Ukraine, for instance, you know, that can only be explained in terms of American support uh, precisely for a liberal world order where countries like Ukraine are not invaded uh, 
uh, by autocratic militaristic regimes like like Russia, just as Americans responded in the past to uh, aggressions from Imperial Japan and Nazi Germany and Imperial Germany. Uh, it's it's a pretty consistent pattern. And while I think that Americans are often have a very complicated notion of what their interests are, if you look at the way they behave, uh, it's pretty clear that they have been repeatedly willing uh, to 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 make sacrifices both both in physical terms and in moral terms, really, to to support this democratic liberal order against the challenges that constantly face it. You have talked before and you talk in this book about this tension, this ongoing tension between individualism and universalism. And I think we've come to see it play out domestically a lot in this country. But tell us a little bit more about how it informs how Americans see their roles as well or their country's role as a world leader. Well, you know, it, again, it, it is revolutionary to focus on the rights of the individual rather than the state. Throughout history, people, everybody has always focused on the rights of the state and the subordination of the individual. And it wasn't until the American Revolution that the individual really became the focus uh, of, of government. And I think that Americans, therefore, are very, in their own way, they're very aware that this is a fragile situation, that, that if you look at the whole sweep of human history, Democracy is the rarest form of government. Liberalism is the rarest type of society. Um, and they, therefore, they, they tend, sometimes almost in a paranoid fashion, to fear that this is somehow going to be taken away from them. I mean, a lot of the fear of communism during the Cold War uh, had to do with fear that somehow these individual liberties would be lost. And today, I think Americans are also worried domestically as to whether their individual liberties are being threatened. This has been, this is a, is a constant theme in American history, is this great fear uh, that, uh, and I think legitimate fear, that this system is very tenuous and, and, and really needs to be defended and can be threatened uh, by external movements as well as internal movements. What would you count as the biggest ruptures in this American-led world order in the 20th century? You mentioned Iraq, of course. Well, you know, the the biggest rupture is occurs really when the West itself is divided within itself. I think one of the things that we've seen is that when the West has been unified, it's very difficult for other powers outside that system to take to take the West on. Um, we saw these divisions during the Cold War, for instance, uh, when Germany was uh, pursuing Ostpolitik. Um, you know, there have been fractures in the Western system. Uh, there have been times when the United States has uh, essentially, uh, you know, backed away from its responsibilities. This obviously happened in the 1920s and 30s, and that has an enormous effect on the world. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm actually very sort of heartened by the degree to which the liberal world order has held together in this, in this time of crisis. It's been really good to see how many democracies rallied around defending Ukraine and have been helping despite the tensions and complexity of our relationship with some of these with these countries. It's obviously very difficult for Germany to engage in military activity given its history, and I think that's quite understandable. It's a real tribute to the strength of the liberal world order that Germany has found a way to do that in a way that is not threatening to its neighbors. So just going back a, a few decades, um, you mentioned the Cold War, obviously, but what impact did the fall of the Soviet Union have on America's sense of self and role in the world? Well, that's a good question. I think it had, as always in the case of Americans, it had it had two opposite effects. I mean, on the one hand, it did make America, uh, it gave Americans a certain amount of confidence to be to be more involved in the world, which led, I think, uh, to some extent, to some of the interventions that were carried out in the 1990s under under the Clinton administration. Um, but it also, a lot of Americans after the end of the Cold War felt that, well, therefore, there's no need for us to have a vigorous foreign policy anymore. The, the only threat we had to worry about was the Soviet Union. That's now gone. Um, there were a lot of theories in the 1990s about how great power politics were no longer relevant. It was all about economics or globalization or, or what have you. Um, and I think that obviously we've had a pretty rude awakening over the past decade as we've seen the return in, in a very traditional way uh, of great power challengers in Russia and China in particular. In a way, they've sort of taken the place uh, 
uh, of what had been the challenges in the first half of the 20th century, Germany in Europe and Asia, uh, and Japan in Asia. Well, now it's China in Asia and it's Russia in Europe, but it's a pretty similar situation. And, um, and this time, I think the American response has been better than the last time it faced that kind of uh, dual challenge. Before we get to China, I do want to ask you, though, about the interventions in Iraq and Afghanistan and how they changed people's overseas perceptions of the United States and its involvement in the rest of the world. You know, uh, it, it's a good question. And, I'm, and, and but my basic view is that it had a much larger effect on Americans and American attitudes towards foreign policy than it did on the rest of the world. I think we somehow believe that the world supports the United States when the United States is doing nice things and then turns against the United States when it's doing things that the world doesn't like or that the Americans themselves don't like. But let's be you know, cold-blooded about this. Countries basically, uh, like people, their number one question is, what can you do for me now when I need you? And um, what we've seen, I think, over and over again is that whatever misgivings people around the world have, and they do have them, about the exercise of American power, especially when it doesn't uh, uh, go well. Um, nevertheless, uh, when they find themselves threatened, they don't hesitate for a second to turn to the United States uh, for help. And I think that you know, Iraq, as I say, had a huge impact on Americans, which we're still you know feeling in terms of a reluctance to get involved again in the world. Uh, but as far as the rest of the world is concerned, they're They've, they've long since forgotten about Iraq, and they just want to know that the United States is going to be there for them. Bob, I want to read to you a, a line that struck me from your book, um, the, World, the World America Made. Let me read it to you. Americans' lack of self-awareness has paradoxically made their awesome power less threatening than it might be. Americans would be scarier if they actually had a plan. Is this an argument to be without a plan, or, or do we have one right you know, Americans don't have a plan in the sense that, you know, if you look at uh, some countries rising powers, you know, they, they need to take this set of islands and they need to take that set of islands or they need to they need to expand and, and regain as Russia is trying to do regain hegemony. So step one is Ukraine. Step two is the Baltics and and something like that. The United States is what they call in the international relations field a satisfied power. I mean, the United States is a revolutionary power because of its ideology. But geopolitically, the Americans are pretty happy with the state uh, of the world, and therefore they tend uh, to just want to keep things as they are. And I think the rest of the world understands perfectly well that the United States does not have a plan for expansion or have particular ambitions to have more territory. Um, and so, and I think they're also aware, you know, to some extent that the American people in some sense don't always know what they want. And, you know, this is a problem for American foreign policy and the conduct of foreign policy, but it does make Americans less threatening than if it looked like Americans knew exactly what, how they wanted to run the world and were going to take all these different steps. And in, in some respects, you know, the British Empire, which people talk about as being, you know, acquired in a fit of absent-mindedness, but there really was some intentionality to the British Empire, whereas in the case of the United States, I would say we have, Americans have backed into most of their global commitments rather than seizing them. Um, they usually are responding to threats rather than uh, going out and trying to shape things. Uh, I think they would do better if they spent more time shaping. There would be fewer conflicts, actually, but that's the way Americans uh, are. And I think that's just uh, the way a democracy is in, in when, it, when it comes to global affairs. Well, here I am asking you about plans on the day of the State of the Union. Um, your 2012 book um, famously influenced President Obama in his State of the Union address. You've had influence over Mitt Romney as a presidential candidate. What do you hope to hear this evening from President Obama about foreign policy? <laughs> President Biden, um, I, I, I Biden, assume that sorry. he will talk. <laughs> That's okay. President I Biden, that let's get that right. <laughs> I'm assuming he will talk about, I would like to see him talk about the importance of American leadership in the world and why the world is a, is still and always will be a place of, of challenges and that there are those out there in the world who, who not only 
may or may not mean us ill, but they certainly are not in favor of democracy and would stamp it out if they could. Uh, and America uh, has traditionally done something to prevent that from happening and, and are doing so now. And I hope he would make the broad case. I think, you know, I think presidents are sometimes reluctant to make a broad case because they think they'll lose more support that way. Um, you can just talk about how, you know, how barbaric the Putin invasion of Ukraine is, but I would rather see him talk in more general terms about the role of the United States in the world. So there are those who would argue that the greatest threat is not another supermire right now, but um, global health security, uh, climate change. Does that require a different approach to foreign policy than the one you have been talking about? Or maybe you well, would agree I mean, with that those... premises? Uh, no, I, I agree with the premise that these things are all difficult to deal with. But I also, unfortunately, I think the reality is, is the geopolitics tend to trump everything else. And if and, you know, there are many difficulties that we face in dealing with climate change, but not the least of them is the fact that, you know, two of the most important uh, countries in this regard, China and India, in addition to the United States and Europe, you know, they see the United States and, and the West in general as using climate change as a way of keeping them from furthering their own uh, industrial uh, and technological development. You know, they say, you know, after spending decades polluting the world, now you want us all to stop it, but we're still in our developmental phase. So, I think you see resistance uh, in other countries, not only not because they disagree with the goal, but because they see an inequity in the way uh, we're approaching this. And that's a real obstacle uh, to dealing with this problem and, and with many of these problems. As we saw, you, even even something like an international pandemic is not free from geopolitics that, you know, the U.S.-China relationship has uh, uh, both affected and been affected by China's response to the COVID uh, uh, strain. So, um, you know, it, it would be nice if you could sort of set aside all these geopolitical issues and focus on these global issues, but unfortunately the world doesn't allow you to do that. So in 2012, when you wrote that book, there were rumblings about America being in decline. You fought back forcefully, but I'd like you to up to date, update that and talk about that narrative now in 2023. Where do we stand and how does China fit into it? Oh, that's a large question. <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, we are, decline seems to be our favorite topic. And I mean, <laughs> Americans have been talking about their decline literally since the time of the revolution. Uh, I remember a great, uh, a great speech by Patrick Henry, I think at the time of the constitutional ratification debates, talking about how America in its youth used to be more virtuous. So there is a, there's a constant theme of decline in the United States, but I think we have seen time and again that these predictions of American decline turn out to be premature, not because someday they won't be correct. I'm sure, you know, what goes up must come down and eventually the United States will be in decline, but we're not there yet. And I think one of the interesting things, data points in that is precisely what's going on in Ukraine right now. You know, Russia is supposed to be uh, um, and is in many respects a, ma a major military power, at least in the same, uh, you know, general category as the United States. Um, uh, but look how poorly it, it's functioning and it, uh, in this war. And it's pretty clear even now that, that the Western technology is superior and is allowing a, a relatively, comparatively speaking, much weaker country to hold its own against a much stronger country. Um, that's just one uh, data point. Uh, you know, the American economy, I, I don't know how many times I've heard that the dollar is no longer going to be the universal currency, that it's going to be supplanted by something else. But that clearly isn't the case. And the United States is still uh, the place where people feel it's the best place to invest their money, despite everything, despite the growth of China. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that we should not be so focused on our decline, but talk about um, what we need to do with our power that can maintain a peaceful world. Uh, China is certainly rising, but, you know, if you compare China to past uh, great powers, uh, ambitious great powers like Nazi Germany or Imperial Japan or Imperial Germany. It, it, you know, China is not as strong as those countries were and not as it's it's a it's a threat. It's a challenge. It's something the Americans need to deal with and I think can deal with. Uh, but I don't think we need to be too hysterical about creating an image of China as something that is an unstoppable force that that we can't deal with. 
Bob, in a recent uh, Wall Street Journal piece, you made a case that uh, a war with China could bring Americans together. And forgive me if I'm oversimplifying, um, the balloon clearly divided us. Tell me about what you meant by making that statement about bringing us together. Well, I didn't. I'm not saying let's have a war with China so we can bring ourselves together. I'm, I actually was responding to the to the often case. One of the arguments about American decline is that is to talk about the health of our political system, which clearly is not in great health right now. Um, and but I, the piece I wrote in the journal was really meant for the Chinese more than for Americans. And I don't. I was basically trying to disabuse them of the notion that because America seems divided now, this is a good opportunity for China to strike. Because I think it is true uh, that we're trying to take some aggressive move now. Uh, the country there would be tremendous bipartisan support. Uh, for, uh, you know, dealing with that problem. And I, I, even the balloon thing, even the Republicans sort of made fools out of themselves, you know, complaining about not shooting it down or saying that they should shoot it down with their own guns or whatever nonsense they were saying. I mean, the general thrust of, of, of America's response to the balloon was, a, was, was pretty bipartisan. Um, the Republicans are trying to score political points, but I don't think that there's a great disagreement that Americans were unhappy about the balloon event, but in general, that it was sort of symbolic uh, of what Americans increasingly, and again, on both sides of the political aisle, see as an increasingly difficult China problem. Yeah, and how should the US address a rising China um, without making war inevitable? I think, well, first of all, the, the number one thing is deterrence. I, I think it, it, the Chinese need to have real doubts in their mind that they can succeed in, for instance, embargoing or, or taking Taiwan in some fashion, whether it's through a naval blockade uh, or or some other fashion. They, they, they really, I think they need to sort of get past that. And so, that, you know, that's the, that, that's the kind of message I'm trying to send to them. That they need to be careful because you know they are, they are in a disadvantageous situation. And in your new book, you certainly seem to sort of draw some parallels between uh, the first half of the twentieth century and now. Just play those out a little bit for us before we finish, and give us a taste of what you're arguing there. Sure. I mean. Obviously, history doesn't repeat itself, and, and we're facing a very different set of circumstances than we were in the 1920s and 30s. But the general structure of the international system has not really changed all that much. And I, the key element of that system is, is the sort of new factor that came into place after the turn of the 20th, after the, you know, after 19, you know, in, at, at the, turn, the beginning of the 20th century, sorry, uh, that, that, that created a situation where the United States was sort of uh, the dominant power. You talk in, uh, in the introduction about how the United States was the dominant power after World War II. It was even more a, a dominant power after World War I and had a real opportunity then, I think, to establish uh, this the, a, a kind of lasting peace, and we could have avoided World War II if Americans had been more willing to be just a little bit more involved in Europe rather than turning their backs on it entirely. And that's that's I think a message that I, is relevant today. You know, it's it it is possible for the United States to maintain a reasonable peace in the world without conflict if it is willing to be strong enough to deter uh, and measured in its approach uh, to the world. I mean, you asked how to deal with China. I think the lessons of the first half of the 20th century are very clear, that if you can deter a country militarily, you at the same time can urge them to take part in what is really uh, you know, global economy, uh, global politics, uh, other countries have made that decision. There are countries that were once uh, uh, militaristic aggressors that are now uh, democracies and upholders of the liberal world order. Uh, I don't expect that from China, but I think our best approach, again, learning those lessons is to be strong enough to deter while welcoming them into the system as best as possible. Bob, as a last question, I spent yesterday evening rereading an essay you wrote in September 2021 about the constitutional crisis already being here in the United States. Um, right now, are you more or less optimistic about the United States and the state of democracy here? Well, I'm still quite worried, I have to admit. Um, you know, I, I, I know there was this great desire to sort of uh, 
pretend that Donald Trump is going away. And, and there's a lot of, you know, there's still a lot of articles about how he doesn't have the clout that he once had. I, I, I still think he's the odds on favorite to be the nominee of the Republican Party. And if that's the case, then we are going to face in 2024 once again, a real challenge to our to our system, because if, as I suspect would be true, Trump would uh, probably lose a general election by some margin. I, I think at this point we can anticipate that he and his many, many millions of followers will insist that he did not lose. And then we will be in this constitutional crisis with no obvious escape. So I think we, you know, we are we are far from being out of the woods. The 2022 midterms were encouraging, but I think they were just temporary. There were some encouraging elections in Germany too uh, on the way to on the way to Hitler taking power. So I I think we need to still be very vigilant, and I still can only hope the Republicans understand the danger of 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 trying to reelect Donald Trump. Bob Kagan, author of The Ghost at the Feast and uh, editor at large at The Washington Post, thank you so much for joining me today on Washington Post Live. Thank you, enjoyed it. Thank you also to all our viewers. It was great to have you. As you know, you can find further programming on WashingtonPostLive.com. I am Francis Steed Sellers, and thank you.